Uh, I do want to say this. We're, we'll, we'll get into our study of Daniel here. Uh, we're in chapter 6 today. <clears throat> but this has helped my prayers lately. Uh, someone had reminded me, uh, had, had been a prayer for a long time from Psalm 4, verse 8. But it's very easy in life to let crisis, and we'll talk about this a little bit in our text today, crisis or what's urgent take away from most, what's most important. And, uh, and it's, it's interesting that the Psalms have a way multiple times, whether it's David or other psalmists, of reminding us that, that when the urgent pops up, don't forget, don't forget the important. And Daniel will certainly have that message for us today as well. But I just love the last line here. In peace, I will lie down and sleep. Now, the, the world would tell you, you can do that. You can get a good night's sleep. If everything goes your way and everything's all lined up, and you, know, you just kind of go like, yes, that's the way I ordered my day. I want, to, I want to urge you to read the rest of that psalm later. That's not what he's talking about. That this is when life doesn't go your way, when things aren't lined up, when it's not what you expected. And in peace, yet in peace, I will lie down and sleep for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. And so this is, has kind of helped my prayers out because I've started to think, you know, for, for a year and a half now, um, kind of moving toward two, it's been, hey, end this pandemic, end this pandemic. And that's, that's a prayer I'll continue to pray. But I will add to that, God, let this time we live in lead our hearts closer to you. Uh, are we learning in our moment that God is in control, that God is on the throne? And, and Daniel's just such a great reminder that sometimes you're going to end up in a place and a situation in a land or under rules that you don't prefer. And when you're there, will you let the rule and the reign of God determine your choices? And I would just say this, Christians, so much of who we are is about choice. We trust in the Lord by choice. It's a choice. We place it there. When visibly there may seem no reason to do it, we put our trust in the Lord. We have peace, as we sang about, by choice. Not, not because the storms go away, but because we know the master over the storm. And we have joy by peace. Joy is not a destination that when things are where we want them, we'll have it. It's a choice today because God is on the throne. We will rejoice. I will say it again, rejoice. And folks, ultimately, we love because of the way we're loved. Not by merit, not because we've earned it but because God chose it. And so, so much of what we do as Christians is by choice. I want to put that on our mind as we get back into our study. I was thinking a little bit about Daniel. Um, he, he is one of those uh, people in the Bible that just kind of is inspiring, right? He, he's that guy you look to, whether he's young or as we're getting to in our text, now much older, just so consistently is that person you would like to be. And I know being named Joshua, that it's really cool to have a book in the Bible and a character of such great courage named after you. And so whether you're Daniel Clark, Daniel Blackburn, or even Daniel Vrooman in Oklahoma right now, it's just kind of cool to have that namesake, right? But I would say whether it's Joseph, Joshua, Daniel, for Christians, what makes this so neat is that, that they represent really this, this living out of the gospel that Jesus Christ did himself. And for Christians, we all have a new name. No matter what your name is, you're now a Christian. You're now Christ-like. And so we're trying to learn from those things that Daniel showed that will help us be more like Jesus in this world. And as we go into the world, we've said all series long, we want to go in like a lion, have that courage that God gives us because of who he is, and yet saved by the lamb, have that grace uh, to be who we need to be, unshakable and unbreakable in this world. If you're, if you're young and you're drawing pictures today, I would just say you got to go right to the den. We're in Daniel chapter 6. Uh, this is so wonderful. My headline for the lesson would be, an old man is thrown to lions who refuse to eat. What a, what a picture uh, this is for us to look at. So kind of just to set this up, and I will say this briefly today because I know we're all a little more limited today, and so I've tried to every week read through the actual text. We've read a chapter a week each week. I'm going to let you read that on your own today so we can maybe take a, a little more time to just talk about the text, and then hopefully you'll read it together as a family or as you get a chance to later today. Uh, but just to kind of review here, Daniel today in chapter 6 is going to purposefully commit a crime to avoid committing a sin 
which isn't a crime. So this is really a great position to put ourselves into. Uh, coming through the book so far, again, Daniel chapter one, Daniel and his friends are saved from having to have this confrontation with the government. You see, four godly exiles are placed in an uncomfortable position. They're, 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 they're taken to a foreign land and they're given names that belong to the Babylonians. They attend and take in the education of the Babylonians. They even go to work for that empire and their government but they just can't eat what the king has placed in front of them. And so because of their faithfulness, God gives them even more wisdom. Now, this is a great lesson in life. Just because God gives you more wisdom doesn't mean your path's gonna be easier. And so by chapter two, the king has had a dream. No one can interpret it. And in frustration, he commands that all the wise men are gonna be killed. And, and this includes Daniel and his friends, so life didn't get easier. But God gives Daniel the interpretation and even more Wisdom on top. And by chapter three, an image is now made to bring the unity of the kingdom into worship. And Daniel's three friends just refuse to bow down. They can't possibly do this. And so God joins them in the furnace and protects them because of their faith from not only being killed or injured, but the smell of smoke. And impressed, the king gives the Jews freedom to worship their God. And so things are on an uptick. In chapter four, Nebuchadnezzar himself is brought low in order to be saved. What brings his sanity back is that moment, having his king taken away, his, his mind taken away, his power taken away, that moment when he humbles himself and recognizes God is truly in charge. And then chapter five, quick turnaround. Another king is in the same spot, but he doesn't repent. He doesn't turn around. And it's interesting in that chapter, you have one day in the life of that king and his demise. And now Daniel chapter six, Daniel finds himself in trouble again for simply being him. You know, chapter one showed the, the faithfulness and the character of Daniel that kind of set him apart from the others. But chapter six, what we see is this revelation of what sustained Daniel over all those years. And there are a lot of lessons we can learn from Darius and we can learn from those who, who tried to uh, accuse Daniel. Because really what we see here is not just a lion's den, but a den of the making or creation of Daniel's critics. And, and you've probably all found yourself some, sometime in your life in that situation. Someone was out to get you, and they made their trap, and they were trying to get you there. Daniel's there. Now, I'll just kind of point this out again. Secular history has no record of a king named Darius. Uh, I would just have you remember that in chapter five, for years and years and years and years, they had no record of a king named Belshazzar either. Uh, and so maybe someday they'll find that and who knows. But I'll say this, it isn't the missing details of Daniel that bothers most people. What bothers the critic of Daniel the most is God's miraculous power. How do I accept that? How do I deal with that? And they'd rather flat out reject it than look at it because God's miracles offend the sinful mind. And that's going on here even in chapter six. So let's, let's take a look as we go through. And again, I'm not gonna read through this whole thing. I would have you point out in this first section dealing with a conspiracy, verse three, when it says, now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. I just, it, like Joseph, like so many others that, that followed God, they can start out in service and end up in command. And Daniel finds himself there. Now, one of the things we, we learned from this is climbing the ladder to success really quickly isn't gonna impress those who are trying to climb with you. And that's going on with Daniel right here. They just, they don't love that he's being kind of set apart as better than. And, and, and Darius, though he's ruling now for such a short time, is not naive. He wisely appoints, it says here, 120 wise men to watch over the various regions of the land. And over those men, three men. I mean, this is a guy that knows how to delegate authority. And I think more than that, this is a guy who knows how to guard against corruption. You see, political power corrupts. And when it's unchecked, corrupt power oppresses. And here's a king that has that in mind. And so he's created a system of accountability. And not surprisingly, Daniel's one of the top three. In fact, it goes a little further than that. The text shows us, the, the king knows, this guy's gotta be the leader of all of them. I'm putting him on top of all of them. And somehow they all find that out. See, his ability threatened them. And they hated his honesty. You see, they could not deceive Daniel. They, they, they could not corrupt Daniel. They, they understood who he was. 
Daniel was such a good worker, they couldn't find anything to charge him with in his work. His loyalty to the king, his observance to the laws, they're trying to find a way to get him, but they just can't figure it out. Because the real fault with Daniel was he was just trying to be too godly. He wasn't trying to be Daniel anymore. He was trying to be God's man and live like God wanted him to live. And so they begin to talk about Daniel as a group. Uh, keeping him back and jumping ahead of him is not going to be easy. And so how do you solve a problem like Daniel? Well, their first guess is, well, we got to discredit his religion. And maybe you've had that attack as a Christian. The difference with Daniel is there was nowhere they could find fault with his religion. Well, the next step there was we, we, we got to just change the rules. Because of who he is, his integrity, his desire to follow what the king has put before him, we need to change the rules on him here. And the world will do that with you. And in order to get that done because of his loyalty to the king, they had to do it behind the king's back. You see, only the king had the power to get rid of Daniel. But he'd have to be tricked if he was going to do it. And so in a short-sighted rush, they deceive the king. And a group now comes to the king as a delegation. And as these men show up, I can only imagine that this king, who immediately gets the wisdom of Daniel, thinks, well, surely they've talked to Daniel about this first. And so they put this plan out before him. And it seems small enough. It's only a 30-day rule. How bad could that be? They appeal to his ego and his pride. This will make you surely ruler. If for 30 days, everyone makes petitions to no other God, but comes to you alone. And what these tricksters do in the process is they say, you know, as you do this, let's make it under the law of the Medes and the Persians. You know, that way it can't just be overthrown or taken lightly. And so the king, who should have rooted that out as smelling bad right away, misses it and agrees to this rule. And I, I think looking back further into the story, that that night the king spends awake He's thinking about that moment. I should have seen it. I, I should have known what they were trying to do right there. So he signs the law, not fully grasping where it would lead. But I would have you remember, the conspirators didn't fully know where this would lead as well. This story doesn't end like they want it to end. And so here's the next section there, verses 10 through 15. Daniel hears about this being published. And of course, what does Daniel do? He goes right back to doing what he always does. Daniel's just gonna be Daniel. So once again, this law is against Daniel, but it's not just against Daniel. It's a problem for everyone who would be a faithful Jew living in that land. Any faithful Jew who decided that they would petition God instead of the king, who if they were discovered, could be charged, convicted, and killed. You see, the full reach of this law was, was probably not what these conspirators had in mind. They were just after Daniel. But when Daniel finds out about this law, this is what causes us to think. What options does he have? I mean, he immediately goes back to praying and his window's open and they can see him. But, but what options did he have? And I know you've thought about this. Well, he could obey the law and just say, well, if I, I've got requests, I'll just make them known to the king. Or he could appeal to the king. Hey, is there anything he could do to change this law? I mean, he doesn't even stop by the king. He just goes home. He could just take a break for 30 days and not pray at all. And just for a little bit of preacher guilt, have you taken your 30-day break? No, that wasn't an option for Daniel. Limit his prayers, change his pattern, be more careful, continue to pray, maybe just do it in an absolute seclusion. Uh, no, Daniel actually chose none of the above at uh, that particular list. It, he would never pray to the king. That was never gonna be an option for Daniel. We know that already about his character. He knew the limits of the king over the rules itself. In fact, that's what I love. When he heard it had been signed, he doesn't even bring it up to the king. He's just, nope, nothing could be done there. Da Daniel's smart. He gets what's going on politically. But he couldn't limit his prayers either. Daniel couldn't limit his prayers because Daniel couldn't limit his needs. If he stopped praying, if he stopped making requests to God, to him, it would be like cutting off that relationship he was so desperate for and in need of. And so here's my thought. I've asked this from the time I was a little kid when I'm looking at Daniel. Why not just pray in secret? Why not just go out of sight? You can do everything you're doing. In fact, I loved when they said we're taking prayers out of schools years ago. That never bothered me because I can pray whenever I want, wherever I want. I can have my eyes open. I can have my eyes closed. God's with me and you can't make a rule against it. But this is different, isn't it? Something's going on with Daniel here where that's not the answer. In fact, I remember saying, 
Why not pray in secret? Because after all, doesn't Jesus condemn public prayer in Matthew 6? And the answer is no. He actually doesn't condemn public prayer in Matthew chapter 6. What he condemns is prayers that praise self, which typically tend to be done in public. Daniel's prayer, though others might see it, was not about Daniel. It was about who he knew and decreed God to be. And stopping would have said something counter to that. You, you got to play this whole thing out. You see, why continue to pray openly knowing what the penalty would be and that the king couldn't help you? There appears to be a few reasons. You see, unlike chapter one, there was no way for Daniel to avoid obedience through a wise compromise. That was now off the table. This issue was one of public policy and practice, and so it had to be confronted publicly. You see, to privately disobey this decree would be a little hypocritical for Daniel, pretending to keep the law while breaking it in secret. That's just not the man he was. And I would say there's something to this. The enemies knew. They knew he was going to break this law. They knew this was so important and crucial to who he was that his God was so important. They knew he was going to go ahead and break this. It's because Daniel found value in this lifelong habit and discipline of godliness. He prayed three times while facing Jerusalem. His enemies were confident. He's not going to give it up right now, and they were right about that. You see, Daniel would not sacrifice what he needed to remain pure. And this new law implied something contrary to God's law. Maybe you could just go to a king instead of to God. And so Daniel had to go public with his convictions. You see, ultimately, this, this would have been on Daniel's mind as, as someone who has taken to a foreign land and still seeking God. Uh, consider these verses that, that, that Daniel would have known. Again, I told you last week, I really think what makes Daniel Daniel is not that he was born with a greater faith than any of us. It's that he heard the word of God and put his trust fully in it. So Daniel would have gone back to Genesis chapter 12. And verse one, the Lord has said to Abram, leave your country, your people and your father's household and go to a land that I will show you. There, there had to be some identifying with this a sojourning through life. And yet though you're in a foreign land in a place you don't know where your fathers haven't been, he knows God is here. And in verse three of Genesis 12, God looks at Abram and says, I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Daniel's whole identity is wrapped up in the fact that those are not just words in a book, but God's promise to his people that you may not be at home. You may be somewhere you don't want to be. But in that place, I'm using you to bless others if you serve me. And don't worry. If they bless you, you'll, they'll be blessed. If they curse you, I'll see that. I'll take note of that. Christians, I think it'd do us a lot of good to remember that promise is for us as well. That if we keep our eyes focused on God, faithfully serving God, God plans to bless us as well. And more than that, he's using us to bless the world around us. There would have been another thought Daniel would have had. Uh, so Psalm 137 and I'm just going to read verses 1 through 9 here for you. It says, By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? But listen. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, what the Edomites did on that day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. O daughters of Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy is he who repays you for what you have done to us. He who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. Look, they, they knew what ca captivity had looked like and felt like. And there they're asked to sing songs of praises. They remember God made a covenant, a promise with Abraham, a land, a seed, and a blessing. And in this Psalm 137, the psalmist looks toward Jerusalem from Babylon. Jerusalem's in ruins, but he keeps looking 
looking towards this city. It was his motivation to petition God, restore this place, remember your promise, and judge those who brought it to destruction. Now Daniel did this, looking toward Jerusalem, three times, every day, for 70 years, the best we know. But what really ought to stick in your mind, putting those two thoughts together, is that so many of those prayers, based on what Daniel knew from Jeremiah, was for the blessing of the land he was now living in. Jeremiah said, when you go there, you pray, God will bless that land. He'll bless you. He'll bless them. Daniel was praying for the benefit of that place where he was living. And the conspirators here are now trying to stop Daniel from praying. They're trying to stop prayers that often would have blessed them. How short-sighted when the world doesn't recognize that their blessing is seen through God's people. Now, the king misses the implications of this law clearly, but Daniel did not. This law made Darius the mediator between all gods and man for 30 days, but the God of Israel was his only God, and he blessed all through his people, Israel. And so Daniel faced Jerusalem. And there was no way he was going to direct his prayers to the king. His prayers were so consistent that he had no problem being convicted of this crime. You think about how easy it was for his conspirators. Uh, they could have picked any time, three times a day to stop in and look up at the window and say, yep, there he is, there he is again. Not very hard to convict him. But breaking the news to the king was gonna be a little more difficult if you look at the next section here. Verses 16 through 18, we see Daniel in the den and Darius in distress. You see, the king gives the order and immediately he regrets it. Having been fooled, the king has to follow through. And it's, there's a lot of history you can read behind what's going on with this empire right now, but he's kind of bound to this rule, and they knew it. And so Darius, as Daniel's going into the den, is actually encouraging him about his God. This is a truly incredible passage to read through. See, Nebuchadnezzar had taunted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He was so mad. Remember, he had turned the furnace up, and what God is there that can deliver you from me? But as Daniel goes into the den, this king, this king saying, your God's got it. He's delivered you before. He can do it again. I mean, it's really incredible to hear his encouragement. He assures Daniel. And it's absolutely possible that this brand new region, this brand new king, had read through the history of what God had done in Babylon to this point and was convinced by the stories that Daniel's God has saved before and he can save again. And so he commends Daniel's faithfulness and obedience to God. And then as Daniel's lowered into the den and a rock is placed over the opening and is sealed, that seal, again, there's a lot of ideas here about Jesus going into his tomb, his death and the stone and the seal. That seal could not be messed with. No one, no one could deliver Daniel now but God. And so the kings encouraged Daniel that night, he refuses entertainment. He can't sleep. You start to think that this king is suffering more than Daniel. You, you, you read this, this whole chapter. Daniel's in a lion's den being executed. And yet the whole thing's about what the king is feeling, right? Don't you see it? The king is suffering more than Daniel. I imagine Daniel probably had a pretty good night's sleep somehow in this den. Like with his friends, the angel of the Lord is with Daniel in the den. It says they, he shuts the mouths of the lions, and Daniel is saved. And if you missed it before, clearly this is the inspiration for the tokens the lion sleeps tonight. I like to think that Daniel laid his head down on a soft lion pillow, warm and cozy, protected by God. And then verses 19 through 24. Daniel's delivered, the conspirators are destroyed, and again, I like the idea. This is much like the tomb being visited by Jesus' followers early on the first day of the week. At first light, the king who has not slept cannot wait to go see what God has done. The mighty king was not powerful enough to save David or Daniel, and he knew it. And so at dawn, he hurries to the lion's den, and he calls out to Daniel. And I believe this king had every hope that Daniel was going to answer back. He didn't wish Daniel good luck the night before. He didn't say, boy, I, you know, I really regret that I couldn't do something about this, but, you know, it was good knowing you. 
There was no farewell. His first words to Daniel in the morning of verse 20 are very telling. He yells out, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? And joy fills this king's heart at the sound of Daniel's voice. Daniel immediately gives glory to God. And I would just add this. Then after giving glory to God, says, by the way, I was innocent. And that, that's a big part of the story here. That's all the king needed to hear. He'd been tricked. It was time for those men to pay. And I, I just say, because there's a lot of comments about how Daniel survived this night with lions. They were clearly diseased, uh, you know, unable to eat. Uh, I, I want you to understand, they, they were divinely hindered because the moment they're released from that divine restraint, they eat well. They got no problem. God not only delivers his people from their enemies, and here's the point Daniel's trying to tell us, he delivers their enemies to judgment that they deserve. So Darius' decisions, verses 25 through 28. Again, the king has now written a letter, much like we saw Nebuchadnezzar wrote after he comes to his senses, to all nations of men of every language throughout the land. This, this proclamation sounds a lot like that Nebuchadnezzar one. And again, these are words in the book of Daniel, not written by faithful Jews, men that served other gods and didn't know the one Lord God of Israel, who all of a sudden sound like absolute true believers in the God of the Jews. This decree, like Nebuchadnezzar's, is addressed to everyone. It acknowledges that Daniel's God is sovereign. Just think about this. This is a king, Darius, who said, you know, there's a king that's better than me. You find a king that talks like that and still has a kingdom. Not only is there a king, Daniel's God, who's better than me as king, there's a king, Daniel's God, who has a better kingdom than my kingdom. What a statement of faith. See, God alone could deliver, and that stood out to Darius. He's the only one, then, that should be worshiped and petitioned. No one should make requests of any man. They should talk to the God of heaven. So verse 28, Daniel prospers during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. The careers of Daniel's counterparts end swiftly. I won't go into too many details there. Read for yourselves. But Daniel remains. Once again, Daniel remains. He went on to serve not only Darius, but Cyrus, through whom God would bring deliverance to the Jews through the rebuilding of the temple. So let's take a look at this, this chapter here together and, and talk about some things we could learn some lessons from. And here's the first one. Christians who are seeking to be holy should expect hostility. And I want to be very clear. Christians... Because of what you believe, you should not be requesting hostility. You should not be antagonizing hostility. You should not be the kind of person that everybody wants to get to because of your personality. You should be the kind of person that because you reflect God so much, the darkness can't take it. And that's what's going on with Daniel. Daniel was persecuted because he was godly. See, those who want to take advantage and cheat, and connive, are absolutely threatened by integrity. And young people, you're going to get to the job the first day, and you're going to think, hey, we're all here, we're all glad to have jobs, payday's coming, life's good, and you're going to watch. There are people, believe it or not, having jobs that probably don't deserve those jobs. Your job is to be such a light, convicted by what integrity should be, that you stand out. And the truth is, that's not always going to make you popular didn't make Daniel popular. You see, when holy living threatens sinful lifestyles, persecution must be expected. And there are times when not even in your words, but in the way you live, people will be challenged and resentful. And the New Testament reminds us of this lesson. 2 Timothy 3.10, Paul writes, You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, Patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. What kind of things happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, Lystra? The persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I like how Paul just kind of, you know all these things that represent who we are in Christ. They're going to bring you problems, and that's, we're just supposed to accept that. That's a, that's a term, that's a condition to following Christ. In fact, Peter says it a little, little deeper here in 1 Peter 3, verse 10 through 12. He says, dear friends, 
Do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. He said, this should be expected as you live as lights in a dark world. He says in verse 13, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when the glory is revealed. Just stop for a second. When's the last time you rejoiced in the sufferings of Christ? When's the last time when, when, when you felt up against it and in a crisis that you said, you know, this might be exactly what I need to get my thing together? God, thank you for sending this storm. I'll remember your Lord. I'm t- this is a counterintuitive process of thinking. Here I am in trouble. I think I was just serving God. God, help me through this. You're with me is Peter's concept. Look at verse 14. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any kind of criminal or even a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. And I love that idea. Hard times ought to remind an independent people that we are dependent on God at all times. You entrust yourselves to your creator and rejoice. Because when life's hard, Those are the times I remember. This is not where I'm going to be forever. My creator, who I've entrusted myself to, has a better plan for me. Just say as nicely as we can, be ready. Be ready to be disliked when you try to please God. Be ready to hear your friends say, what happened to your sense of humor? You're not funny anymore. Why why are you not a friend to me? Why are you not giving me everything I need? Be, Be ready. For family to say, I don't even recognize you. You think you're better than us. Be ready for the world to resist the light that shines through Christ. I'll just tell you, I would love to be able to please God and men all the time. That's the goal. But the reality is sometimes you can't do both. And you know which one you must choose. And when you choose God over mankind, the world hates it. Hates it. I just say this, we as a people have had it really, really good for a really, really long time. And Daniel ought to kind of snap you into that reality. And maybe what's happened is we've been lulled to sleep by the ease and the comfort of life as we expected. But our adversary, the devil's on the prowl. Be ready for resistance when you shine for God. Here's a Another thought from the text that I think is important for us to look at. God will fully deliver those who serve him faithfully. God, God is in the delivery business. He, he, he gets the job done and he will no matter what. And, and not only that, as we learn in Daniel here, he will judge those who persecute us. He, Daniel was delivered and God took care of his enemies. This, this is the setup, the arrangement God has made for his children. Daniel was not persecuted because of sin. He suffered for righteousness sake and the king couldn't save him, but that didn't hinder the hand of God. God's not limited. And so he sends his angel and he shuts the mouths of the lions. Daniel was saved by God to assure all of us who would serve God, God can do what man cannot. God knows how to deliver us from judgment and he knows when to deliver us to judgment. God's over all of that. In fact, I love how this is kind of spelt out as an example in the book of Hebrews. We, we look at Hebrews 11, this kind of hall of fame of the faithful, and there's this list that goes out there. And so often we, we miss this, but I, I love bringing this up and reminding us of this. You see, there are those on that list that did great things. They were delivered from death, and Daniel was one of those. He shut the mouths of lions. But Luke goes on to write in verses 35 through 40, the list of those who were delivered through death. This is the hard part for us. I want God to deliver me immediately and instantly from any pain or suffering, and God does not promise that to anyone. He can, and this goes back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, oh, Nebuchadnezzar. 
we're not going to worship this, this God you've made. Our God will save us, but even if he doesn't, he will deliver us from your hand, O king. And this is the concept that Daniel kind of reiterates for us again. Know this. God will always deliver the faithful, whether through life or death. God will deliver. And since our hope is not in this world alone, but in a heavenly kingdom, a heavenly city, we can face either life or death with joy. Whatever the outcome, if we're with God and God is with us, we cannot lose. God will deliver his people from the wicked and God will deliver the wicked to judgment, is Daniel's thought. Here's another one. And this is really important, I think, even to some of the things Seth was saying earlier. We need to learn how to deal with crisis. Crisis tends to distort our focus. Something urgent comes under the human mind. And, and so when I have something urgent to deal with, it's amazing how I put off the important or, or the, the preeminent sometimes. Daniel clearly understood the difference between the urgent and the important. He didn't panic. He didn't change his practices. He didn't shift his priorities. Daniel was Daniel because this is what God wanted him to be, and when it was against him, he just went back to being Daniel. He kept seeking God and his kingdom first and trusted God to provide everything else. I gotta tell you, there's something we could all learn from a courage like that. He was unshakable and unbreakable. And I would just say, maybe this is what we learn. It's time to get in the habit of forming godly habits in the calm times. When you you got a second, how am I going to serve God? What what is a a process I can get into, a discipline that, that I can do, no matter what? Because here's what happens. If you don't develop that in the calm times, when the crisis comes, we let go of all those things that tether us to God because all we can see is not the eternally important, but what's temporarily urgent. Be careful. See, too many times our godly disciplines will fade away just for a little fatigue. I'm not feeling 100%. The right matchup is on. The right entertainment is before us. We need to, to just determine, like Daniel, that this is what tethers me to God and I'm not going to let it go. And so you make that plan and you hold to it. And I just say maybe this answers a question. Do the godly perform extraordinary things when faced with crisis? I would say to that, maybe, but probably more importantly, they just keep doing the things they did before the crisis came. They trust in the Lord with all their heart, and they don't let go of what tethers them to God. Which leads us to maybe learning from the lessons of Daniel's prayers. Daniel had, obviously, a lifelong habit of praying toward Jerusalem three times a day. And everyone knew this about Daniel. i I just tell you, his co-workers knew his prayer habits somehow. And I don't think he was talking about it. I think think in the course of working with this man, they got, this is what this guy is all about. And and just put that on your brain again. What, What do the people you know about your prayer habits in connection with God? You see, Daniel 6, verse 10, and then going to Daniel 9, 4 through 19, tells us exactly what Daniel was constantly gabbing to God about. It said he was making petitions, that is requests, and he was giving thanks. I just want you to think about that. Daniel had so much to ask God about and to thank God for that he couldn't stop praying for 30 days or he'd be so far behind, how would he ever catch up? Three times a day. He had to get these requests made to God because he saw himself as dependent on God. He was, in fact, and we miss this. We miss this because of our earthly, worldly brains. We see a guy, a kid, taken to a foreign land. He's better at school. He gets good grades. He raises to the top. They go, Daniel's so great. Daniel was great because his God was great, and Daniel knew it. In his mind, he's telling us, cling to the Lord. He'll direct your steps. He saw himself as absolutely dependent on God. He was powerless without the daily provisions of God. And just think, isn't that what Jesus told his disciples and us about prayer? Lord, give us today our daily bread. There are provisions that, yeah, You work the job, you get the paycheck, you bought the food. 
But without God, you have and are nothing. And Daniel understood that about himself. You see, without God's grace, he had no way to please God or work well with those around him. You think about this. The next time you're really struggling with personalities at work, ask, where are my prayers right now? Am I the person that those people need? Maybe I've, I've, I've not asked God or thanked him for my job enough this week. Daniel knew he had great needs and only a great God could meet him. This, this could be why, by the way, in our, our world of getting everything so easy and quick, has our prayer life so anemic and powerless and weak. You see, we can just stop realizing that it is God who provides all things. Everything. Amazon might have dropped it at your door. I'll tell you, I stopped being so thankful for Amazon because they're not taking my cardboard back. I got to figure all that out. But it's God who provides everything. And when you forget that, why would you ask God? Just work a few more hours. Just put a few more things on you. You're the one in charge. Daniel refused to believe that, and we need to get there too. We, we forget only God can meet our needs, our real needs. Fill us up where we're empty inside. We overlook the important for what's urgent in a moment. Daniel knew that daily prayer was the best way to not forget how much he needed God. And then the last thought here, I think this is a really cool tie-in in Daniel 6, is that what's going on with his deliverance here is an absolute illustration of the gospel. This chapter illustrates what people don't like about God. Just like the religious leaders of Jesus' day, holiness is terrifying to the wicked. Power and authority in this world are opportunities for selfishness and gain. And the righteous get in the way of that plan. They, they, they mess it up. You know, they're, they're no fun. They, they don't get that, that you're holding us all back. See, when, when word got out that Daniel's gonna be number one, that's when these guys reacted. He was okay at number three, but when he was the last word before the king, they panicked, absolutely panicked because they could not corrupt him. And they knew that about him. You see, a godly person in power is going to be a threat to all ungodly people under their power, which is weird, right? Because you couldn't have a better boss than somebody who loves God first. But the reason is, just like the authority of Jesus, they're not being threatening, but they won't be corrupt either. Those who want to persist in sin hate righteousness hate integrity, hate godliness. And Jesus didn't abuse his authority. He, he used it sacrificially. He died for our sins so we could gain at his expense. That's, that's what this shows us. Daniel's enemies tried to use the law to destroy him. In fact, had to twist the law to get it done. He was innocent by God's law, and so God shut the mouths of the lions. Daniel paid the penalty of the law. He was in that pit, but he was free to serve God. You see, in a sense... Daniel dies to the law in chapter six. And this is what the gospel does for us. God gave his law. It was perfect. It was holy. It was immutable. It was irreversible. It was God's law. And we as sinners have all fallen short of God's glory and broken that law. And we are guilty to come under the sentence of death. Death is the penalty for sin. But Jesus steps in and becomes a man and dies in our place, and died to sin and the law, then rose from the dead. And when we, by faith, die with Jesus in baptism, we are set free from the condemnation of the law. We're free to serve the living God. And that would be the question I would have for you this morning, looking at Daniel 6. Have you been set free from the condemnation of the law? Who will save me? Oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from the body of this death? No, the answer is Jesus Christ, who became righteousness for unrighteous men. Thank God for the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And Jesus doesn't just set us free so we can go about our business life as usual. He sets us free, like Daniel knew, so that we can freely serve him. And that wherever you find yourself at work and in this land, you know God's blessing is on you. Those who bless you, he will bless. Those who curse you will be cursed. But ultimately, God wants you to be a blessing in this land you live in. Don't forget who you are. 
That's what made Daniel who Daniel was. And if it helps, add to your discipline and prayers this week this prayer. No matter what happens around me, no matter what situations I can't control, in peace I will lie down and sleep for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. You want a major theme in the book of Daniel, it's this, Daniel never, ever forgot. Here's a man who who the book's going to record serves under at least five kings. But Daniel came into the land and ended his life knowing who the one true king always was. Don't forget, don't forget the sovereignty of God.